would like to call the special meeting of the Tuscarawas Valley Local School Board of Education to order. Call the roll. Mrs. Burger? Present. Mr. Goody? Present. Mr. Overton? Yes. Mrs. Green? Present. Will you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and the invocation? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this beautiful uh, summer morning. And Lord, uh, as we come together here, uh, we just pray that uh, you would give us guidance, wisdom as we uh, make decisions for the Tuskegee Valley School. We pray for the kids, uh, Lord, that they're still uh, able to enjoy a vacation and time off. And Lord, as we prepare for this fall, would you give us extra wisdom and how to do that. And we just pray this, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before beginning further, I would like to remind everyone who is here that they do have to sign in at the black table up front, please. So if you have not done that, please do that for record keeping purposes. Number two, public participation bylaw 016.9.1. The Board of Education recognizes the value of the school governance of public comment on the educational issues and the importance of allowing members of the public to express themselves on school matters of community interest. The Board offers public participation to members of the public in accordance with the procedures below. The Board applies these procedures to all speakers and does not discriminate based on the identity of the speaker, content of the speech, or the viewpoint of the speaker. Public participation shall be permitted as indicated on the order of business. Anyone having a legitimate interest in the actions of the board may participate during the public portion of the meeting. Attendees must register their intentions to participate in public participation of the meeting upon arrival of the meeting. Participants must be recognized by the presiding officer and will be requested to preface their comments by the announcement of their name, address, group affiliation, if and when appropriate. Each statement may be made by a participant shall be limited to five minutes duration unless extended by the presiding officer. The portion of the meeting during which the participation of the public is invited shall be limited to a total of 30 minutes unless extended by a vote of the board. Mrs. Wedding. The board would like to acknowledge that we value a long-time positive relationship that we have with the TV TVA Association and staff. We have received each, we have received, and each one of us have read the documents that you were you provided us. Given that this is a timed meeting, we have set a limit of today's meeting's time due to work commitments. We would like you to please limit your time today to five minutes. On a housekeeping note, please speak into the mic. It will be recording you for the re recording, but it will not amplify your voice. Okay. Thank you. You may begin when you're ready. Okay. Well, good morning. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Sarah Whitting, and I'm representing uh, TVTA today with the full support of the TVTA Executive Committee. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I feel muffled, so... Um, I have been a teacher at Tuskegee Valley for five years. Um, I've been an educator for eight years. And actually, uh, Mrs. Burrier's daughter, Katie, was in my first class. So it's so cool to think like she's going to be graduating this year. So um, that's just a little bit about me. Um, what I would like to express today is the TVTA Executive Committee's desire to work collaboratively with Mr. Murphy in the weeks leading up to the start of the school year to come to an agreement over the plan for the fall. We have no intention of requesting that TVTA enters into formal negotiations with the board. We understand that this plan is subject to change and are willing to move forward with flexibility and understanding. The current Safe Start Planning Guide outlines specific changes in working conditions for all TVTA members and TVTA representation was not a part of the planning for these changes. As such, and per our negotiated agreement, 
we ask for the opportunity to bargain these effects in an informal yet legitimate manner to ultimately develop a memorandum of understanding that specifically addresses these changes and our agreement to implement them during the 2021 school year. Again, we're willing to move forward with flexibility and full awareness that the current plan, even with board approval, is subject to change. It has been indicated to me that making this request is somehow sending the message that TVTA does not believe in our administrators or believe that they know what they're doing. The TVTA Executive Committee and I do not agree with this perception, and I trust that the board has faith in the hearts of their dedicated educators. Seeking out collaboration and an MOU demonstrates TVTA's desire to work with leadership, indicating trust and respect. We honor the work that has tirelessly been done by administrators that we know well and trust. We are not asking to scrap the plan that has been diligently and carefully crafted over the past two months, only that we have the opportunity to address the remaining concerns and come to a consensus over the changes in working conditions. It is hard to breathe through a mask when you are nervous. I also came here to address supplemental contracts that have not been issued. It is a past practice that most fall and winter supplemental contracts are is issued in the spring, allowing coaches and teachers to begin summer and fall preseason work with liability protection and guarantees. As I'm sure you are aware, these contracts were never issued and dozens of teachers and coaches, members of TVTA, community members and parents have been working for the past several weeks without a written contract. Their work has been acknowledged and encouraged by both Mr. Murphy and Athletic Director Steve Franks, yet they have no contract guaranteeing their employment, liability protection, or compensation for their many hours of preseason planning and practice with students. Though I am sure unintended, the goodwill of these coaches and teachers is being taken advantage of. These contracts must be issued immediately. With that, the TVTA Executive Committee and I fully acknowledge the unprecedented times that we are in and the many difficult decisions facing administrators and the board with regards to sports seasons. We also acknowledge that mandates and directives from the governor, the Ohio Departments of Education and Health and OHSAA are constantly changing, which creates obstacles for decision making and planning. Under the current situation, per Ohio Revised Code and TVTA's legal counsel, the coaches and teachers are currently operating under an implied contract with the district and in the event of a cancellation, would receive 100% of last year's contracted pay. To mitigate this burden for the district on July 3rd, I went to Mr. Murphy with a recommendation for an MOU outlining a compensation schedule for supplemental contracts, not unlike the many being adopted by schools all around Ohio and even locally. Because we have no language in our contract that stipulates how coaches and teachers are paid in the event of a calamity cancellation, developing an MOU that does adopt this language is a win-win. TVTA is committed to work collaboratively with Mr. Murphy to develop and adopt an MOU for supplemental contract compensation. We are also willing to share the MOU developed by the TVTA Executive Committee. On behalf of TVTA, I wanna specifically thank Mr. Murphy and the administrative planning team for their diligence and planning and their commitment to our schools. It is difficult to comprehend um, the amount of detail and planning that is going through their minds at any given moment of any given day. I do not think that anyone in our district, myself included, could say that they have not given their all to this plan. And for that, TVTA is grateful. In addition to our administrator's commitment to Tuskegee Valley, the board has made it a point to be present and visible in the presentation meetings of the past two weeks. I personally appreciate your dedication to our district and know that the health and safety of our staff and students is a priority. In the days to come, TVTA members will be making good on the promise that you make with the community today and in the future as plans change. 
We are confident that collaboration will lead to the best possible outcome for Tuskegee Valley Schools. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Sarah, Sarah, I'm sorry, Mrs. Whitting. I no, sorry. Could you please um, send the, the Ohio Revised Code that you are citing to me? You did not list a number. Yes, I will. Thank you. You're welcome. I will provide a written statement via email within one week. Number three, approve the following resolution. Whereas a vacancy has been caused on the Board of Education by reason of death, and whereas the Board of Education has the legal authority to fill a vacancy for the unexpired term thereof, now therefore be it resolved by the majority of all the remaining members of the Board of Education of the Tuscarawas Valley Local School District that Katherine E. Johnson be and hereby is appointed to serve as the member of Board of Education of this school district for the unexpired term of Charles Knack, ending December 31st, 2021. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Catherine, if you would please stand for the... Oh, wait a minute, sorry. Call the roll. Mrs. Burrier? Yes. Mr. Gooding? Yes. Mr. Overton? Yes. Mrs. Green? Yes. Mrs. Johnson, will you please stand for the oath of office? Katie, do you solemnly affirm that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Ohio, and that you will faithfully and impartially discharge your duties as a member of the Board of Education of the Tuscarawas Valley Local School District, Tuscarawas County, Ohio, to the best of your ability and in accordance with the laws now in effect and thereafter to be enacted during your continuance in said office and until your successor is elected and qualified. Yes, I do. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item number four, new business and consent agenda. I will not read the consent agenda. Everyone should have an agenda in before them, and if not, there's one on the black table. Is there a motion for the consent agenda? Yes, I'll make a motion. Second. I'll second. Discussion. Mr. Phillips, do you have any comments based on the appropriations or funds listed? Uh, the only thing that I guess that I would like to point out is if you look at the second page on page three, we have funds 507 and 510. Those are CARES Act funding from the federal government. They, they're coming in two chunks. The first set of monies in Fund 507 did not have as many strings. It was a little it was a little looser in how we could spend the funding. As we get into Fund 510, the coronavirus relief dollars, those are more specifically targeted to new items that the district, new expenses that the district is taking on as a result of COVID-19. Any further discussion? I'd like to draw everyone's attention to item three. Uh, we're really thrilled to welcome these three individuals to our Tuskegee Valley family, to our team. The first is Tori Connor. Tori is coming to us from Claymont City Schools. Uh, she has currently, has currently served or been serving as a uh, literacy and instructional coach, and she is going to be joining our kindergarten team at the primary school. Uh, Kathleen Locker, uh, will also be joining us at the primary school uh, for Title I Reading Intervention Specialist. Uh, Kathleen has uh, a few years experience serving as a Title I teacher in New Philadelphia City School. So we're really thrilled. Uh, Kathleen also has a, her whole entire family is educators, and so we're, we're really thankful to invite her on board. And Jordan Witter is not a, a, an unfamiliar name to us. We're welcoming Jordan back. Uh, he has been at Claymont City Schools for the past two years, was with us prior to that. Uh, I'm not Claymont, went to West Holmes to serve as a uh, high school social studies teacher as well as head boys basketball coach. And we're thrilled to welcome Jordan back and, uh, and their families as well. So I just wanted to bring that to the board's attention and publicly welcome them. Um, the other, you know, under item five, this is part of our consent agenda, but I would just like to press pause for a moment here. 
Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Item 5 is currently listed under consent. Am I reading that correctly? They acknowledge the 21st century grant? No. Item 5, the Safe Start Plan. Oh, no, right. the consent's 4 at the top yeah. of the second page. We're nine. on 4. 5 is going to be separate. Yeah, 5 is separate. Okay. All right. There's just not a vote. No, there's not a vote lying on okay, for that. Sub then, then I will address that later. Yeah. So that concludes anything I would like to share about the consent agenda. Anyone else have any uh, discussion or comments? Call the roll, please. Mr. Overton? Yes. Mrs. Burrier? Yes. Mr. Gooding? Yes. Mrs. Johnson? Yes. Mrs. Green? Yes. Number five. Approve the 2020-2021 Teskey Valley Local School District Safe Start Plan, including a plan to provide instruction using a remote learning model for the 2021 school year, if and when necessary, in accordance with the House Bill 164, subject to modifications. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. I'll second. Discussion. So at this point, um, now I know that the board is fully aware you've, you've watched this document, the 31-page document, evolve over the past several weeks. And I appreciate your attention and just your mindfulness of watching that and asking questions and along with our community and staff members. I mean, it's just, it's been a big, big process. And as you know, we began that in early June uh, when we were thinking about, well, what if? I mean, based on everything that we knew, if we had to look at limiting the capacity of the numbers of kids in the building, how would we go about doing that? And that's when um, our building principals and OSS um, and our counselors started to work with us, to work with me uh, to help create just, and it was very, very basic. Um, and then from there we waited because we didn't know what the governor was going to come out with or what the mandates or the orders or and, and we were waiting on the Department of Education's reset, restart. We had seen some preliminary drafts of that. It started, you know, one version was 17 page. One version was like 35, then it went to 17, and now it's, you know, it's complete. So um, all that to say is, you know, the, there's a packet in front of you that really just is the, the overarching uh, four, four pages. Our, our plan, the goal is to not make it as long as it as long as we you know possibly can. The goal was to just try to provide as much clarity as possible and and flexibility through this whole thing. So, but if you look at the number at the bottom of your page, it says four. These are the overarching guiding principles, and you've heard me talk about this. We've done the Zoom meetings, we've done virtual coffee chats, four staff meetings with all employees for if they'd like to jump in and, and know what our plan. Uh, what we were thinking through, as well as an in-person meeting um, in the auditorium about a week ago or a week and a half, I don't know, everything's blurring together. But the overarching guides are the um, Ohio Department of Health, Health and Safety Guidance for K-12 Schools, the Ohio Reset Restart document from the Department of Education, the Coronavirus Alert System, which is the Ohio Public Health Advisory System, that's the county color-coded, Piece. And as a team, we believe that it was most appropriate to, to, with our plan, to align it with the county's color system and not introduce a different color system, not introduce, we wanted to just be congruent with, with what the state documents were already showing us. So of course, you can see where the expectations, the, this guidance list from the Department of Health specifically list the, the four expectations about assessing symptoms, washing and sanitizing hands, sanitizing facilities, doing maintaining the social distancing. And you'll notice I didn't highlight this, but you could highlight it. it districts are are supposed to establish maximum capacity in all school environments based on six foot distancing. Now you know from room to room, building to building, that capacity would look different, you know, in our classroom. Some rooms are a little bit bigger than others. Uh, so what we've done is we believe that it was most appropriate to really limit our capacity by looking at a hybrid model if we needed to and then blending that hybrid model with the color system. And then the other requirement is the facial coverings uh, for school employees. And at that point, 
it was still a strong recommendation for face coverings to be worn by students grades 3 to 12. I'll tell you, then last week you saw the governor's order that face, face coverings for everyone in public um, ages 10 and above. Then I believe it was late Friday afternoon, uh, fellow superintendents had texted me with a, a picture of another order where the governor, it, it was a change, and it, it was still a strong, it wasn't like an exemption for the student face coverings was K-12 schools. Still a strong recommendation for grades three through 12, but it's like the order was lifted in this environment. So I would just say, stay tuned. Um, I will tell you that I believe that the plan that you'll see, if you if you flip to uh, page seven, the face covering policy. Um, again, we've tried our best to capture the documentation from the Department of Education and the Department of Health, but all school employees will wear face coverings throughout the building and at work, um, unless it significantly impedes with the learning process. We are going to provide face masks and face shields to all district employees. We will, follow, we will provide face masks uh, for students uh, or anybody else that there may be. A, we're not encouraging visitors. We're really not going to allow visitors unless it's an emergency. But if someone comes into our building that needs to be there, we want to make sure that they're properly covered. Um, at this point, I, I guess we will just keep with this statement where the governor, well, it was, I don't know if this is still subject to change. Um, yeah, but that's true. I think that we should, It's a. I think that there's a part of me that just says we should require grades 10 and above, or ages 10 and above to wear them. If, if we're in a hybrid mode or an in-person mode, I, I just think with, with mass breaks, we want common sense and good judgment to be used, and, and we trust our teachers and staff and principals. They're monitoring that. If you're properly spaced in an environment, you're six foot, that would be a great place, a great time to take off your mask, take a break if you want to. No one's gonna be required to, but I, I, in light of what the governor issued last week, but yet kind of changed at the very end of the week, I believe it would make the most sense to just require the face masks for ages 10 and above. Students on the bus, same thing. Then we're consistent, grades three and above, ages 10 and above. Uh, of course, we would encourage all kids to wear masks, even K, one, two. But this way, we, we would at least be consistent with what the governor has either recommended, then required, and now recommended. <laughs> if you're following me. Okay. Um, and then page six, does give a breakdown of specifics in terms of safety and sanitization. Um, it doesn't, this is the overarching guide, it doesn't, you know, you're not gonna see here at this time, at by this person, on this, that, that is going to be determined over these next several days and weeks ahead of us. It has to be in conjunction with our building principals and our teams, our custodians, our food services, our teaching staff, the how, will be, has to be figured out over these next several weeks. I don't want to dictate, I don't believe it's my, unless, it, unless it's a wreck, but I don't think it will be. I, I trust our folks to be able to create that and, and manage that. But this is the overarching guidance for that. Um, the last piece I'd like to draw your attention to, which is probably one of the most, it's the big driver, if you will, the decision framework, it's, it's listed as page five. And I know that you've seen this the community has seen this, um, and it's all pending, you know, with pending board approval, and I kept communicating that this is draft, pending board approval. But you'll see again where we did align our system with the county color system. So if, it, if our county is yellow, we know that our goal would be that we would open at full capacity, all kids, every single day, and then do our very best, the key word, our very best, to, to practice the the health standards and expectations that have been outlined for us. But I will be the first to tell you, I mean, this is just, it makes common sense. You are not, you don't socially distance in a school environment. People are not, I mean, it's hard for us to socially distance. So in a classroom with all students, all I can say is we will do our best with six foot distancing. Um, 
you'll see across the board, currently it says face coverings required. And if you go back to that page about face coverings, then we're, again, we're looking at ages three, ages 10 and above, grades three and above. If we're, if the county is orange, we felt that for us, it made the most sense based on everything that we had in front of us. If, if there is increased exposure and spread and the state is saying there is, you need to be exercising a high degree of caution, then that's where we need to limit the numbers of kids in our buildings, in all of our environments. And the best way that we felt for our students, for our population, for our staff, and, and the goal was to have our kids with us. Our students need to be with their teachers, yes. in school, in classrooms, with their friends, with their peers. I feel so emphatically about that. If this, I want our kids in school. We have got to have them with us. But the goal is to have them with us for the longest period of time. I really believe that if we were bringing everybody to back, I mean, we this system could say the word traditional could be under orange. It could be, if we're in orange, we open normally. And I just don't feel that that's in our best interest. I feel like that would be a pretty quick way of us losing ground and having to revert to remote quickly. That's not our goal. We, we really want to have our kids with us for the longer period of time. So, under the hybrid mo model, uh, students would be assigned two groups, um, I, and I'm not going to go into all of that detail. We're, we're going to keep planning with that too, but students would be assigned to group A or group B and attend two days in person, three days remote. Uh, the six foot distancing is our goal, obviously, face coverings required again. If the county were to turn red, then we would maintain a hybrid mode. You'll see where, or it says remote. Uh, again, we want there to be flexibility with this. And, and you'll notice that at the very top, bold italics, regardless of color, unless otherwise ordered by the governor or the health department, decisions about the operations and capacity remain at the discretion of the superintendent. With the board's authority to me, I will make that decision based on everything that I have available to me, based on the, the recommendations from our team. So why that says hybrid or remote, is for that flexibility. If we are having a specific situation in Tuscarawas Valley Local Schools and the county is red, we and, and we've got a situation, we've got students, or we've got increased cases, or we've got increased cases with students, increased cases with staff, or staff shortage, whatever it may be, that's where I'm going to have to make the decision to, are we going into remote, or are we going to be able to maintain hybrid? It's a, it's a decision. It's based on it's based on the scenario that we're dealing with at that time, and then of course, if it were purple, I think that's pretty clear. I mean, it's that's basically stay at home, unless it's an absolute emergency. So, you know, the, <laughs> I didn't want to spend the time to go through a thirty-one page document. You've been through that. We went line by line. Amy and Sally were with us, uh, you know, a week or so ago in the auditorium where we did pretty much go through line by line. Uh, and with the staff, we went line by line. So any thoughts, questions from our board, anything else that, that we've not thought of that you want us to be mindful of for our team to continue planning? Um, again, this is a lot of the what and the guidance, and now the work after if pending board approval, then, a lot, then it's our team working on the how-to and to make sure that as best we can. So thanks for your time, thanks for your support and listening, um, and for your involvement and your feedback through this, because we all have personal preferences. We all have a leaning, a political stance, a whatever, and, and I appreciate because you can't use that. And I will be honest with you, I have emails where people have, I mean, it's just to, I love this, thank you for looking out after our children's safety, to, you are ridiculous, you are foolish, you're following the dictatorship of the governor, I mean, I, I, you get everything, and some of it not so kind. Um, so, I really believe that this document, our plan, is the safest, the most thorough, the most balanced. Our health department reviewed our plan 
and gave a few suggestions. And so, and, and really, I, and I appreciate that. And the comment, the one comment that she made was, this is the most thorough plan that I've seen so far. Very well done. I will also tell you, you know, I had a two hour meeting with the health commissioner with other superintendents on Thursday afternoon. It was two hours of confusion. And, and that's no disrespect to uh, Commissioner Seward. I mean, it, but they're really, they're working 24 seven right now to do investigating, phone calls, contact tracing, all of those things. And, and I said to her, I said, you know, Mrs. Seward, how, we're, we're not open across our county. Your biggest employer, other than Union Hospital, Clinton Clinic Union Hospital, your biggest employer and your biggest congregate settings have not even opened. How are you going, do you have the capacity, do you have, does your staff have the capacity to do this? And that question, she, you know, she was very kind, but she couldn't answer that question. It will be in every, I want you to know, people are quick to say, so Mr. Murphy, what about this? What about that? Are you going to do, are you, what about if Sally tests positive? Or if Ben's a direct contact? Or Ben thinks, or Katie thinks she's a, it's a case by case scenario. The when I ask the question, can you walk us through what happens when? When we have a student, when we have a staff member, well, first of all, it is an immediate phone call to the health department. And then we follow the directions and guidance from our health department. And her response was, it's very complicated. And for the next two hours, we heard about positive symptomatic, positive asymptomatic, calls, investigation, people that are cooperative, people that are not cooperative, and if it's uncooperative, out of an abundance of caution, we close. So we are we are truly, you know, I commend our teachers, our staff, our entire, I mean, everyone. In March, it was immediate shutdown. And, it, and even in that environment, over two days time, I believe our team put together probably one of the best plans around. And it was implemented brilliantly, not perfectly, brilliantly. And even with all this time, my goodness, it, to try to watch this unfold and change every single day, we've got a good guide and we've got a decision framework to help guide us. But with your grace, with your authority, and based on everything that I had, and I know I will face great scrutiny, and on behalf of our board, there will be great scrutiny on either side. And my experience has told me that the majority of people who don't email and call are okay. Um, a great compliment, you've seen it on that poll, nearly 92% of our population that, that participated out of that 861, 92% said, we want our children to be with our Tuscadelli teachers, we will follow whatever model is designed. So, the other thing I want to just mention, then I'll close and open up for any questions that you may have. Um, the other, you know, it's in, I, I just want to be very candid with you. There, there are there are some that are that are firing off really nasty. communications to me, I mentioned it earlier, and and questioning every little thing. I will not be responding to every little thing. Um, I, I can't. I mean, I received an email on late Friday night from a parent that questioned the poll. Who wrote the poll? Who wrote the surveys in May? Who wrote the surveys in July? The four question survey insinuating that I was leading, that I was guiding people to vote the way I want, that is not the intent, that was not the purpose. I, I, I did a survey like most other school districts do. Many other school districts used our survey, the four questions. Uh, but the question was, you know, Mr. Murphy, 57% of your parents said that they want full in-person every day, and you're not doing it. 57% was the majority. I've had a superintendent tell me, hey, you know what? 
57% is the majority, and if that were an election, you win the election, call it done. Again, just because it says 57% does not mean that's, it may be a majority, but I, I, I'm still gonna use it as a guide and make the best decision. The question, the follow-up to that was, okay, so if the parents 57%, but the staff, the staff on that question was 26%, only 26% want full in-person return. So the scrutiny is, why is there such a difference, Mr. Murphy, between what the staff is saying and the community is saying? So why are you, so, so in other words, you're supporting the teachers only. You're not doing what the, what the community wants and the community pays for you. The community pays your salary. I mean, those are the kinds of, I just want the board to know that's the reality of what we're doing. But I, I don't really, I don't like this. I, as a dad, I, as the superintendent, do not like a hybrid or a remote. I want our kids with us. I don't have the luxury of just being the dad and making the decision based on the dad. I don't have the luxury of just going with whatever majority says. I have to be, we have to be very mindful of the entire thing. And I appreciate your support through that. Um, I, again, I believe that this represents our district, our families, our plan, safe, thorough, balanced, ever changing. Ever so, changing. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll stop talking, but I, I wanted you to know my heart and, and the details behind this. Any discussion, comments? I'd like to just say thank you to Mark. Uh, I do recognize the effort that you put into this and those that you're working with. And, uh, it doesn't go unnoticed, so thank you. Thank you. It is a team effort. <laughs> well, and Mrs. Green, you uh, did a, a, a video uh, for the public, and I feel that uh, uh, we are looking at the safety of everybody. And uh, so I think, uh, again, this always has the ability subject to change because it's beyond our ability. This, this situation uh, has... Uh, just caused all of us to be able to adapt and um, I think now I can't put a time frame on it but this too will pass eventually and we'll be looking back uh, and saying man remember when, remember when we had to do this uh, so uh, we're in that remember when part and all we can do is do our very best. And we're, we're as a, at least my opinion as a board member is that uh, we are for uh, the staff, we're for the teachers, we're for the custodians, we're for uh, everybody and their safety. And, but we are still in Tuskegee Valley doing what's best for the kids. And, and that's what we have to use as our overarching uh, decision. So. Thank you, Mark and uh, Mrs. Green. Before I call the roll, I would also like to thank all those who worked tirelessly to make this step first step possible, and I'd like to emphasize first step. This is a process. This is the beginning. And in the coming days, you will see more of that process unveiling. Once the plan is in place, that's when the true work will really begin, and we applaud those who will have to Work tirelessly for that. Thank you. Call the roll. Mr. Gooden? Yes. Mr. Overton? Yes. Mrs. Burrier? Yes. Mrs. Johnson? Yes. Mrs. Green? Yes. Item number six, approve the following resolution. Whereas Mr. Charles Knack, the former board member of the Tuscarawas Valley Local Schools, has served with the district with distinction, and whereas Mr. Knack has dedicated his time for the betterment of the students and community, and whereas Mr. Knack has proven to be dedicated to the craft of board governance through his commitment to training, service, and governing skills, and whereas such measures have advanced student achievement in the district and improved the governance of the district, therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Tuscarawas Valley Local Schools nominate Mr. Charles Knack for the Ohio School Board Association Recognition Award posthumously. Does anyone have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Call the roll. 
Mrs. Berger? Yes. Mr. Goody? Yes. Mrs. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Overton? Yes. Mrs. Green? Yes. Number seven, approve the following resolution. Whereas Mrs. Susan Kaschek, a former board member of Tuscarawas Valley Local Schools, has served with the district with distinction, and whereas Mrs. Kaschek has dedicated her time for the betterment of students and the community, and whereas Mrs. Kaschek has proven to be a dedicated to the craft of board governance through her commitment to training, service, and governing skills, and whereas such measures have advanced student achievement in the district and improved the governance of the district, Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of Tuscarawas Valley Schools nominate Ms. Mrs. Susan Kaschek for the Ohio School Board Association Recognition Award. Is there a motion? So moved. Second? Yes. May yeah, we have discussed a second? Yes, I, I Thank saw you. your look. I saw my look. <laughs> are we in discussion now? We are in discussion. Okay, well, I want to regress a little bit back because of being the elder um, on the board uh, here, uh, the number of years that I served with both Chuck and Susan, uh, they were awesome uh, board members. And each of us bring different uh, talents, abilities, knowledge, wisdom uh, uh, to the board. And uh, both Chuck and Susan, uh, in their ways, I really felt helped move our district ahead. And uh, I'm so tickled to be able to, to do this. Any further discussion? Call the roll. Mr. Gooding? Yes. Mr. Overton? Yes. Mrs. Burrier? Yes. Mrs. Johnson? Yes. Mrs. Green? Yes. Number eight, announcements. As advertised, a work session will be held following the special meeting <coughs> for the purpose of the board orientation. No action will be taken. The next regular Board of Education meeting will be held Monday, August 10th, 2020, at 7 p.m. at the Tusky Valley High School Trojan Center, right here. Is there a motion for adjournment? I'm going to make a motion. Second. Second. Call the roll. Mr. Overton? Yes. Mrs. Johnson? Yes. Mrs. Burrier? Yes. Mr. Gooding? Yes. Mrs. Green? Thank you for attending.